Good morning, everybody. Um, I think most of you know me. I'm Laura Bruni. I'm the CEO of the Arts and Business Council. We're excited to have you here for our second Maximizing MAP session for 2021. Our, um, our Miami Arts Marketing Project series is kicked off. We had our first lab um, January 26th, which was a big success. Our next lab is February 23rd. It's our popular fundraising in the new normal session. So if you haven't already signed up for that, we will um, follow up and send you information on that. I wanna thank Dan for being our featured speaker today. And I wanna thank our sponsors, Miami-Dade Department of Cultural Affairs, Greater Miami Visitor and Convention Bureau. And we partner with the Greater Miami Festivals and Events Association as one of our co-hosts for all of our Miami Arts Marketing Project series this year. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carmen, Carmen, and she's gonna go over all the logistics. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, just to echo what Laura said, we're happy to have you here. We're happy to have these um, little sessions already be such, such a success, along with our MAMP Labs. So I hope you're getting all the communication so that you could sign up for the upcoming labs for the rest of the year. There's also gonna be other maximizing sessions for um, Matt, March, I'm sorry, and then the rest of the year as well. So take a, uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, I am the new director of programs and events here with the Arts and Business Council, so I'm excited to be here and to host you all. Uh, I'm going to be the one helping to moderate at the end with the Q&A, so just, you know, be tuned for that. Um, we're going to try to keep the answers short uh, and brief, but we, you know, we want to be able to give an opportunity to everyone to ask a question. Now, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and introduce our session leader for today, who is Dan. He is the founder of BizHack Academies, and he is an amazing storyteller, and he's going to go ahead and give us all the information about how to supercharge our Facebook ads. So take it away, Dan. All right. Well, thank you so much. And, um, you know, I do this all the time and, and with lots of different groups. And just one last plea to if you could turn on your video, if you're in a position to turn on your video, studies have shown it makes a huge difference in terms of your retention and understanding of what we're gonna be talking about. There, there's a more personal reason as well, which is it's much harder for me to do a good job for you if I don't get to see your faces. And I miss terribly being doing these kinds of presentations in person. And so it would be a favor to me as well if you could turn on your videos, I would really appreciate it. And thanks to Rebecca and Michael and the rest of you for you know, your, your attention and your time and, and your video. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna blast through a quick presentation overview, uh, and then we're gonna dig into the, your questions. Um, and so I'm gonna go fast intentionally, and then you can slow me down with your Q&A. So I'm gonna spark probably a lot of questions and we're going to spend the rest of the session digging through them. It's a little bit of a different approach than what I normally take, um, but hopefully uh, it'll work for y'all. Dan, can I just interject quickly? Um, will you be able to send us your presentation afterwards so we can send it to everybody? Absolutely. That's a great point. So don't feel like you need to scribble notes, just scribble questions and ideas, and then you'll get all of this presentation sent to you as a PDF, okay? All right. Sound good, Rebecca? All right, thank you for nodding. Okay, so I wanna start with a story because I am a storyteller after all. It's about Moon River Cabaret. Now, just to be fair, um, this is a pre-COVID case study. So a little bit of what we talk about, uh, it talks about a, 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 a reality that's a little different than the one in which we live. But I do want you to know that it is uh, absolutely relevant to show the, the power and impact uh, that is possible through uh, nonprofit uh, and arts organizations using Facebook ads. So Moon River Cabaret was a cabaret show. It's an adult show. It's a strip show, if you will. Uh, and they were uh, the only cabaret show in South Florida, uh, and they needed a permanent home. They didn't have a permanent home. And in order for them to be able to get a permanent home, they had to find temporary venues willing to take a risk on them, and then they had to sell them out. Uh, and they had chosen uh, Barter Wynwood um, as the ideal location for them to do their cabaret show. And they had had two shows and had promoted the heck out of it to their friends and family. And 
they had reached the kind of limits of their friend and family network. They what they were finding is that ticket sales were slowing down because, you know, they were holding the shows every month, and there's only so many times your your brother and your aunt and your best friend are going to go to the show. So they had two great shows, and then for their third show, they started to see a dramatic drop off in interest and in attendance. And they were really, really worried. And they knew that if they weren't able to drive attendance another way, Barter Winwood was not going to continue with them. And this is an analogy that I think is true for a lot of nonprofits. You you have an audience. This is an existing audience. This is these are people people who are friends, family, and supporters. And you need to break out of that audience. You need to attract a new audience. People move away, people lose interest, their lives change, they have children, and you have to find new audience members. We call this selling to strangers. And Facebook ads are fabulous ways, you'll see, to sell to strangers. So that was their challenge. They needed to sell out. They really needed to sell out. It was sort of a life or death kind of thing for them. Um, their previous efforts had just been organic posts and kind of shaking the tree of their friends and family. And despite targeting their core supporters, no sellouts. So they decided to take a different tack. They uh, worked with BizHack to create a Facebook video ad campaign, uh, worked in one of our programs. And it was a very simple campaign. It was a video slideshow. Uh, of about five images using a cr free software that we can talk about if you're interested in it called Lumen5. They spent a total of $20. They ran the ad over six days and their goal was this thing that Facebook calls a through play. And all a through play is, is to get somebody to watch the full slideshow, the full video. So Facebook calls it a through play. It just means how many people watched the video to completion. And by the way, this video was 12 seconds long. And the recommended length of a Facebook ad video is six to 12 seconds. And so, you know, it seems intimidating to talk about creating a video. We teach our participants how to make a video in under 30 minutes with a zero dollars uh, budget. So for free in 30 minutes, you can create a six to 12 second video that can be very effective. That's exactly what Moon River Cabaret did. So. Their target audience were two different groups. One were veterans and two were lookalikes. And I'm going to talk to you briefly about each of these audiences. And then if you're interested, uh, I can definitely dig in a little deeper about the audience targeting options that Facebook has. And we can do that in the Q&A. So Facebook um, gives you a free tool uh, called Audience Insights. And through that free tool, they discovered that military veterans were a burlesque audience. Now, they didn't realize that, but in retrospect, it makes a ton of sense. A lot of these folks were exposed to burlesque when they were overseas and serving in the military, and so they have continued to love uh, burlesque shows. And so they found that that was a targeting criteria that allowed them to advertise to strangers who had a high likelihood of wanting to watch a burlesque show. They also found that folks who liked Off Off Broadway, Dinner Theater, Pin Up Stars, and Transgender Friendly also really liked burlesque. Uh, and they targeted people within 25 miles of Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and Boca Raton, because these were folks who were willing, they were within driving distance of Wynwood, and also those were communities where they could potentially have future shows, um, and so they wanted to begin messaging to that audience, hey, there's burlesque in town for the first time. Um, the other group that they focused on were what are called lookalikes. And a beautiful way to think of a lookalike audience is friends of your friends. So you don't want to target your friends with an ad necessarily because they already, you already can reach them through phone and email, but you would love to target your, their friends of your friends. And Facebook gives you the ability to do that through a tool called the lookalike audience. And if you're interested, we can talk more about that and how to do it. So that was their audience targeting and the ad was a huge hit. With the $20, they got um, 1,500 people to see the ad um, and it cost, uh, and 269 of them actually watched the video all the way through. And so that cost them only seven cents per through play. Back then they called it a 10 second view, but it's the same idea. So 
seven cents per video view and 32 people then clicked on to the ticketing website. So that's a cost per click of just 63 cents. This is another way to view the, um, the results of the ad. Awareness is the total number of people reached. Through plays are the number of people who actually watched the video, 13%. And then conversion, or how many people actually clicked onto the ticketing website, 32. So 1.6% uh, of the people who uh, watched the video. Those are very typical, good results. We often say, um, if of your reach, you get about a 10% consideration or through play and a 1% click through. That's a very standard kind of result. So these results uh, are, are, are very good, but not out of, out of the park. They're pretty standard. And so here's what happened. The ad led to more pre-sales. It also importantly raised awareness about the show. A lot of people in Miami are last minute ticket buyers, as we know, and it led to a rush of door sales. And there was no way for them to directly attribute the ad to the door sales. But I will tell you that the, the rush of it last minute buys did not happen in either of the two shows prior. So they did all the same advertising as before, all the same marketing as before, and then added Facebook ads and they got a rush of door sales. This is a really important insight, which is when you advertise digitally, you will see a bump in website traffic and purchasing that isn't directly tied to the ad because people will see your ad, they'll then go and Google you, they might come to your theater or to your arts organization and do the purchase there, and then you might not realize unless you ask them, and they might not even know that that's how they learned about you. People don't tend to always remember they said, oh yeah, I checked out your website, but they only knew to check out your website because they saw the ad. And so as a result, 92 new people attended the show on a $20 ad spend. The ad, tickets were only 10 bucks. So they spent nine, they spent $20 to make $920. That's a 900% uh, increase in revenue. And that's a 4,500% uh, uh, return on ad spend. So it's a really dramatic result uh, with a very minimum effort and spend. So my name is Dan Gretsch. I consider myself a business storyteller. I spent more than half of my career working at nonprofits like NPR, PBS, and WLRN. And um, I also have worked as a marketer for large companies and startups. Uh, went to Princeton and FIU, and I was a Fulbright scholar. One other uh, thing that nonprofit folks like to know is my wife is the CEO of Catalyst Miami, Gretchen Biesing, which is one of the big nonprofits in town. So I really understand the challenges and opportunities of nonprofits. Um, BizHack has been recognized by the Knight Foundation, the Miami Herald, Goldman Sachs, uh, AMA, uh, as a top uh, provider of digital marketing education. We've also partnered with all of the big uh, major educational institutions in town and a lot of the incredibly important um, community partners and community service organizations, including Arts and Business Council of Miami, who Laura and I have been working together now for four or five years. Uh, I've been on the MAMP. Uh, steering committee and have been a presenter at MAMP for a number of years. So today we're going to talk about how to use Facebook ads to drive attention to and support for your arts organizations. We're going to make sure now that you understand the difference between a post, a boost, and an ad. This is a common confusion for beginning marketers. And we're going to also introduce you to a couple uh, free tools uh, from Audience Insights and called Audience Insights and Creative Hub. Uh, it's amazing to have Michelle uh, and James, two old friends. Um, thank you for the kind words, guys. Really appreciate you and appreciate having you here. Uh, both of them have been through a lot of our training and um, you know can, can talk about uh, what they've gotten out of it if there's time. So I want to make a case to you for digital advertising because most nonprofits don't advertise or they're afraid to spend money on advertising. So first of all, if you're looking to sell to strangers, if you're looking to grow your audience and you, and you need to break out from your existing set of friends, family, and, and existing supporters, and you're not sure where to start, 
Facebook ads are a fabulous way to start. And there are a couple different reasons for that. The single most important is Facebook ads are, from BizHack's opinion, the best learning tool there is. They're the, it's the best way to get started in thinking like a digital marketer. Just like my daughter who takes dance is studying ballet, even though she doesn't love ballet, she likes hip hop and contemporary, but she's creating a, a foundation of learning through ballet that she can then apply to every other type of dance. And just like if you wanna be a guitarist or play the ukulele, you start by learning your chords on the piano. These are the foundational tools that you use to learn whatever it is that is your passion or whatever it is that in the case of marketing will make you the most, will draw you the most audience. But our strong recommendation after doing this with thousands of organizations over seven years is that Facebook is the best learning tool. And there are a couple specific reasons why. First of all, when you do paid advertising, one of the big benefits is you get immediate results. So you know, almost overnight, whether your campaign is working, whether you're targeting the right audience with the right offer. So in the case of um, the cabaret, they only ran that campaign for six days and they knew immediately that the campaign was working and that allowed them to then run a second campaign for their fourth show and so forth. So what I love about it is the learning cycle with Facebook ads is almost overnight. If you do SEO, for instance, search engine optimization, where you're writing blog posts and other things, it can take you six months or more to know if things are working. In Facebook ads, it can take you six hours. Second is Facebook and Google are the behemoths of online advertising. And so I wanna talk a little bit about why starting with Facebook versus Google. First of all, I know a lot of us don't like Facebook. To me, they're a reprehensible company with bad privacy practices and have done a lot of damage in the world, but they're also a tool. And they're a tool for arts organization and business growth, and we should leverage that tool. Facebook, which has more than just Facebook, Facebook also includes Instagram, uh, it includes WhatsApp, it includes um, uh, uh, the audience network and messaging, reaches 80% of the digital audience in the United States between all of their platforms. So Facebook is as ubiquitous as Google in terms of its digital presence, and they cost way less than Google ads and are way easier to use than Google ads. Facebook is also a great, you know, if you will, gateway drug uh, to LinkedIn and other types of ads, uh, Twitter, um, you know, TikTok. And the reason why is because all of those folks copied Facebook and the way that they build their ads. Um, and so Facebook really, everybody else is a fast follower. Facebook is the pioneer and Facebook is the 80 pound gorilla. They represent the vast majority of advertising. So if you understand Facebook, then moving into these other platforms is very simple. I am not saying that you should or must advertise on Facebook. If you experiment and it's not getting you results, move on. But it's a great place to learn and it's a great place to start. Um, and then finally, there are tons of free tools that we'll talk about that allow you to leverage the billion user data that Facebook has. I'm gonna wrap up the presentation here uh, by saying, when times are bad, you must advertise. This is old white guy, Bruce Barton, uh, dead for half a century, but his insight, he's one of the fathers of modern advertising, and his insight is that now is not the time to stay silent. Now is the time to get loud and noisy. The worse your situation, the louder you get, because you need help. And there's no way anyone's gonna be able to help you if you don't make some noise. So with that, let's open it up to questions. I hope uh, you guys are putting questions into the chat. Um, and then uh, anything that I talked about is fair game. And we'll, we'll, I have some other uh, things I'll wanna make sure to present over the next 30 minutes or so. And we're not looking for, uh, we want live questions too. So raise your hand if you have a question. I was just gonna say that. Yeah, let's go ahead and start with um, some questions. I'm gonna go ahead with Yvette first and then Michael Andrews. 
Um, I have. A, is there a difference if you hire a marketing company to do your Facebook ads? Because we, um, I work with the Department of Cultural Affairs um, for All Kids Included, and we usually use a company called Matrix to do our Facebook ads. But I'm just wondering, is it worth paying a marketing company? Is there any difference in paying someone else to do the Facebook ads for you versus you doing it yourself? Yeah. So. The, 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 uh, you know, of course, Yvette, the, 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 the answer, the, the, the annoying answer to your question is it depends. But um, let me give you um, maybe an answer that'll be a little more useful than that. Uh, the reason I say it depends is because if the marketing agency is doing a good job for you, uh, if you trust them and they're uh, helping you drive revenue for your organizations, then, then yeah, that's a great option. The reason why I say it depends uh, is there are a lot of agencies that people hire that don't get them results. And uh, I know Laura and I, right before this, were talking about how she's worked with some contractors who really weren't emphasizing the right things. What I really believe, the way that you measure success in advertising is the bottom line. Are they driving butts and seats? Or are they driving donors? And if you can't put a straight see-through line between their activities and your bottom line results, you need to really ask yourself, is this a good investment? A lot of these folks will say, oh, we're raising awareness. Great. Then you should see month over month as they're working with you a bump in butts and seats. And if you don't, that tells you that the raised awareness is not going to the right audience and that you're not converting the raised awareness to, to greater ticket sales. Um, another way to measure success is lead generation. So the, 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 the trick with Facebook is Facebook owns those relationships and they don't give you their contact information. They want you to message them and get likes and follows and engagement inside of Facebook. But as many of us know, you might get a post that gets 100 likes, but it might not drive a single donor. And so what I call that is a vanity metric. Yvette, what you really want are email addresses and phone numbers of potential donors and potential supporters. And so you need to direct your agency to get you that. And you need to work with them to make sure they're driving you a steady flow of email addresses and phone numbers. And if they're not, I would be questioning whether it's worth the investment. Yeah, in, in our case, we're, we're, we really don't look for donors um, because we're not trying to raise revenue. We're just trying to raise participation in the programs that, that we're offering the community. So um, let me ask you, as a result of your social media agency, are you seeing an increase in participation in your programs? Um, I feel like we would have the same participation if we would do it ourselves. But I guess because uh, there's been a few times that we haven't used them and I've just been doing the ads myself and our post ourselves. And I, I think that um, the people in our community that, you know, that they depend on our services and our programs, they follow us and, and it's kind of word of mouth kind of thing. So I think yeah. maybe we just need to try it out and not use them and see if it's worth it or not. Yeah. I mean, that one of the best ways to, to measure something is to stop it, start it, stop it and start it again and see if you see changes. Um, here's here's a, a, an important, two, two other important insights. I'm sorry to go on so much about this, but I have a feeling this is a re very live question for many of you. Number one, if you don't know what your agency is doing or if they're meeting your goals, that's your fault. That's your fault. And if they're not successful, it's your fault they're not successful. And, and because of that, you need to educate yourself enough to be able to set clear goals and measure success. And if you can't honestly say, I know what they're doing and I know if it's working, you need to educate yourself. Whether it's with BizHack or many of the other options that are out there, you're not able, you're not enabling yourself to find success. The other point I wanted to make is when you hire an agency to do this kind of work and your budget is relatively small, you're basically giving 50 or more percent of your ad budget to them. So if you have $1,000 a month that you can spend, 500 of it is going now directly to that agency. 
And that's $500 less dollars that you could use to advertise to find new customers. So hiring an agency when you're a small budget organization is like tying one hand behind your back. So we generally don't recommend micro enterprises hire agencies when they have the ability to learn this themselves. Once they've learned it themselves and set up some good best practices, then it might be a good time to bring in an agency because otherwise they're, it's, it's very expensive for a small organization. Dan, can uh, I do a quick follow-up on that? Please. I actually participated in one of Dan's programs and um, what I learned was that we want email. You know, we don't, we don't want just more likes. We don't want more followers. We want to get people on our website and get them to sign up for our email. So when I gave our agency that direction, now we can track and see how many new emails are we getting from the website because we know when on our constant contact when they come from the website. So now we have a really better metric for testing if, if what they're doing is successful. But also a lot of the micro groups and the smaller groups, do you have the time to manage it yourself is also an issue. I mean, if you've got a thousand dollars a month to spend on social media, figure out how much time it would take for your limited staff to actually do the social media and determine if, if you can do it that way rather than hiring somebody even though you're gonna have less in ad money. Yeah, I'm a big advocate for educating yourself because I don't think you'll be able to manage that thousand bucks a month effectively if you don't know what you're doing, whether you do it yourself or hire someone to do it for you. And that's that's really what I'm an advocate for is, I call it ready, aim, fire. We're aim, this hack is about aiming, right? It's about helping you understand what is a reasonable goal, how to measure success, how to manage you know, a partner or an agency or a staffer to do this for you. But most of you are ready, fire, and you're throwing spaghetti against the wall and often it isn't working. And I gotta be honest right now, like right now, Yes, you should advertise, but advertising by throwing spaghetti against the wall is a bad idea. It's a recipe for failure. Um, James Eccles asked a great question in the chat, um, and I'd like to address it because it's an important foundational set of understanding. I'm going to actually share my screen really quickly. James asked, can I advertise using Facebook in Instagram and WhatsApp? And this is a very common um, kind of misconception, which is that an Instagram ad and a Facebook ad is something different. In fact, Facebook, Instagram, Facebook Messenger, the audience network, which is all of these affiliated websites and mobile apps, and WhatsApp are all part of an integrated Facebook ads platform. And so when you think about advertising, don't think about Facebook, the social media platform, think about the advertising platform owned by Facebook. And that advertising platform means that you create a single ad and it can appear across all of these channels. One quick note about WhatsApp. Facebook has been talking for years now about adding ads to WhatsApp so that like you're streaming your WhatsApp, you, you, know, you see your WhatsApp chats and there's an ad tucked away in there. And they have not done that. They, it is, there is very limited ad capacity in WhatsApp. What's more important is that you can have the objective of an ad be for them to WhatsApp you. So for instance, you can run an ad on Facebook or Instagram or Messenger, and then the call to action button is not go to my website, but message me on WhatsApp. So they are integrating WhatsApp in that way. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about organic versus boosted versus ads. So an organic post is just a post, uh, like a status update, and it's free. Um, and the problem is it doesn't reach many people. If you look uh, back in 2012, your average organic post for a business page would reach about 16 out of 100 of your followers. Today, that number is one or two. So in other words, if you have 100 followers and you post, about 1% or one of those 100 will see it. Uh, this is called Facebook Zero. Uh, the reason they call it Facebook Zero is soon uh, organic posting will reach exactly zero of your followers. What does that mean? Facebook is pay to play. And then you have two ways to pay Facebook. One is boosting your posts and the other is an ad. And this chart 
which you'll get a copy of, shows you why advertising is much more powerful without being more expensive. All that a boosted post does is it basically reverses time and it gets you to more of the amount of reach that you used to get in 2012 for free. So in many ways, I say that a boosted post is basically paying for what you used to get for free. But honestly, I don't think of it as a very ethical product. I don't think most people get much out of boosted posts except for that little dopamine hit, that vanity metric of more engagement, likes and, follow, likes and, likes and follows. But those actually aren't driving emails, phone numbers, or butts in seat. So that's really the issue, is, is ads are a much more powerful way to reach strangers. However, it does require a more larger investment of time to learn how to do it. And the reason why, and I'll just do this one thing and then we'll take questions again, is when you're running an ad in Facebook, this is where you go. It's called Facebook Business Suite. And it looks nothing like the normal Facebook page, which let me just show you, like what you're used to seeing is this. And when you get to your Facebook page, you, um, you can create a post and you send a status update and it's easy and it's familiar. Um, and it's posted and that's what you're used to doing. And then it's easy to, to then, uh, boost it, um, and get it to more followers. Uh, and that's why people tend to boost because it's easy, but it's not effective. You have to go and go into this much more complicated place and you need to build ads here. And it takes a minute to, to learn how to do that, to create an ad and go through that. And that's, that's why we advocate educating yourself. There's a lot of free resources on Facebook. It's called Facebook Blueprint that teach you how to do this. And then there are programs like the one we run and others run that teach you how to use this tool for your specific business using coaching, one-on-one uh, -on -one and group coaching. So that's, that's really why we advocate ads. They're more cost effective and they'll get you more butts in seat, but they do require an investment of time to learn it. That's great information, Dan. And I just want to um, reiterate on one of the things that you said, that if you are going to hire an agency to manage your social media, that it's up to you to kind of like follow up with them and ensure that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I think one great way to follow up with them is to just ensure that your agency is giving you analytics, that they're showing you proof of performance, that they're showing you like the ads that they are saying that they're posting and what what results are they uh, yielding, whether they're a boosted ad or you know a boosted post or an ad. Um, just seeing what kind of results they're showing up for you and, and asking maybe on a weekly basis or monthly basis for them to show those reports to you. Um, I think Michael Andrews had a question earlier. I want to give the floor to him. Thank you. Hey, Dan, I, I actually have two questions. Um, I wish I'd known this before. We just did a live stream uh, with South Beach Chamber Ensemble last Sunday, and I did a boost. And uh, I thought I was being really extravagant. I spent $100 for the boost. And the great thing is we got 15,000 people, uh, you know, to see the bo see, see the, the boost. That didn't uh, translate into viewers for our free live stream on Sunday night. Um, but so, my, so one question is, what's the difference between a reach and a click? Yeah, okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about marketing terminology. So are you guys, let me actually show, I think it'll be easier if I show you this while I explain it. Give me one second. All right, this should work, hang on. Okay, so do you remember when I showed you that kind of funnel uh, from, from the campaign, from the, the, um, the cabaret? Okay, so this is called the marketing funnel. And the marketing funnel is a, visual representation of the customer's journey from stranger to buyer. And there are, and this is just like marketing 101, there are three stages in the funnel traditionally, awareness, consideration, and sale. 
or conversion. So awareness is about them going from never having heard of you to having heard of you. And that's what a boost will do. It will help you get to a stranger. Um, ads are also good for that. Consideration is that next step, which is, okay, they now know who you are. Maybe they've given you their email address and they're considering, do I want to attend one of your performances? Do I want to support your organization? And then the sale is that actual, okay, I'm going to make a purchase. Now, the, there are metrics that measure each of these stages in the funnel. And the two most important ones for awareness, awareness are impressions and reach. Impressions is how many people see your ad when they're scrolling on there. Because most Facebook folks are on their phone and they're watching your ad as they scroll. So they're scrolling down and your ad shows up. And if they scroll right back past it, that's an impression. Only about 10% of people who scroll uh, by your ad will even click on it or look at it. So, that, so that's impressions. Reach is the number of individual human beings who, who see that ad. And therefore, reach is always going to be smaller than impressions because your ad can and should be seen by the same people more than once. So just to explain, you might have 100 people reached by your ad, but because each of them saw the ad twice, your impressions is 200. We clear on that? So that's impressions and reach, really important. Next is consideration. Do they actually engage with the ad? And that's where the through play, did they watch the video in its entirety? That's consideration. So through play uh, is one example of them considering you. Another example is an open on an email. So if they open your email, they're now engaging with the content. And then conversion is the click. So a click is them actually taking the next step in the customer journey, clicking to your website, hopefully buying a ticket or donating. Those are conversion metrics. So the higher you are in the funnel, the larger the number, and the lower you are in the funnel, the more intentional and valuable the action. And you generally have to pay more money to get them to do the revenue generating things. And you can run ads at each stage in the funnel where the goal is to get them to watch a video or the goal is to get them to click to your website or the goal is to get them to give you your email address. And because, not surprisingly, getting them to give you an email address, a lead generation objective, is much more expensive than to get them to watch a video. I hope that was clear. That's as clear as I can make it. Thank you. And I, I have one more question. Um, yes, sir. With the ad results that I did, um, how do I find the location of the viewers? Because uh, for the previous concert, we had people from all over the world listening. And I'd like to be able to tell in my final grant report, you know, people from X country listened. Yeah, so, so there's, there, the inside of the Facebook platform, uh, there are insights that you can gather um, and you can look at the insights um, and gain data about exactly who saw your ad, where they're from, what their gender is, what their interests are, and a ton of other information. Great. So Facebook insights is what you're looking for. Thanks. Is Thank you, any? Michael. Oh. Oh, sorry. Before we address the two raised hands, um, there were some questions in the chat that I'd like to, I think, um, just address really quickly. They're asking, like, what are what performs better, photos, carousel ads, or videos? Um, what are your thoughts on them? Just a few quick thoughts, and then we could hand it over to um, Jane and Zuri, who have their hands raised. You must, you must always advertise using video. Um, if you're an e-commerce company, carousel can work, but for pretty much everybody... Um, you know, on this call, if your video is, is the vernacular of the web, it will get you much larger viewership for less money. Um, you know, if you're doing it specifically on Instagram, uh, you know, an Instagram story can be very, very effective. Um, also, um, you know, uh, some of the, 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 the newer um, kind of TikTok like uh, reels, uh, which Instagram is, interest, uh, is introduced are also very effective. But yeah, video, video, video. Thank you, Dan. Um, Jane, I saw her hand raised first, and then she could go, and then Zuri, you'll go after Jane if that's all right. Hi. 
I'm um, I'm in the process of learning a lot about Facebook advertising. Um, and I'm not sure if I know if the ad that I just placed is an ad or a boosted post. Yeah, uh, <laughs> if you're not sure, it's probably boosted um, because you know creating an ad is a very intentional thing. Um, and if you're not sure, you probably boosted it. Like what Facebook will do is spend ten dollars and reach a thousand more people, and you click a button and you pick an audience, and it's a boost. Okay. Then where do you go to make an ad? Yeah, I was showing you that earlier, but here I'll show you again. Um, so you go here, you go to ads in your business suite. In order to create a business suite, you go to business.facebook.com and you sign up, you add your page to it, you put your credit card information in, and then you click up here to create an ad. It's, it's hard to like, it's hard to do it by mistake, I'll tell you that much. Like you really need to have a certain baseline of knowledge to create an ad. You need to be intentional about it. Boosting a post, you can kind of like do it by mistake and there you go. I know what I did. But so like my boosted posts are still in that feed. Yeah, what Facebook has done recently they, to make things more confusing, frankly, is they've integrated boosting into the ad platform. Uh, so, and you can even see that one of the ad objectives is boosting a post. But what we, we never recommend folks do that. Uh, rather, uh, we recommend you do some of the more intentional um, things like get more leads. And, and then this gives you an option to use a form on your website or a form on Facebook to collect the contact information. The form on the website is a great place to start. Uh, it's just very expensive. It can be a couple bucks per email address. So um, it's not usually where we recommend people start. Uh, rather, we recommend people start with getting people to watch a video. It's the cheapest uh, campaign, and it will allow you to understand if your audience and your offer are correct. Before the end of today, I'm gonna give you based like seven years of work on a framework for how to think about advertising that I think will be very clarifying for many of you. So I'll take a few minutes at the end to, to kind of share that, we call it the lead building system, but I wanna keep taking questions um, before we get there. All right, Zuri, take the floor. Thanks. Um, so there's obviously been a lot of rumors about the new iOS um, system of just blocking a lot of the ads that our people would be able to see. So obviously there's not an, enough information, it's not verified or anything, but what can we do in preparation for that in case a lot of our audience are being blocked that are using iPhones and, and the new iOS systems, um, they're not going to be interacting as much with Facebook and possibly um, Instagram ads. So what can we actually do to prepare for that or to combat that in our own ads? Yeah. So in the new iOS, Apple is going to block, uh, allow users to choose whether Facebook can basically follow them on the internet. Um, and this is an existential threat uh, to Facebook's advertising approach as it currently exists. Facebook has waged a massive PR war with Apple um, because, you, you know, basically, if you don't know what Facebook's product is, it's you, your data. And this puts that at risk. Um, the two largest companies, two of the largest companies in the world are basically taking like full page ads out, uh, attacking each other. It's quite a thing to behold. Now, Zuri is asking, what do we as a micro marketer do about this? And the answer is we wait and see. There is no clarity at all of what hasn't started yet. We don't know what's gonna happen when it does. You know, Facebook is a very smart and resilient company. I wouldn't count them out. And honestly, it doesn't, in my opinion, in the near term, change anything I'm telling you about Facebook as a fabulous way to reach strangers. So um, Facebook, for instance, is looking at ways to uh, collect the same data through another method. And, it, it, you know, I have a feeling that it will have uh, an impact, but less of an impact um, than, um, than uh, some people predict. And um, what this is all about is Facebook collects a lot of data about your likes, your interests, and your behaviors. And then it allows you to target those folks with that data. And there's this fabulous, fabulous tool 
called Audience Insights, which basically allows you to leverage the heck out of that. So the way you get to Audience Insights is you, um, uh, is, is this is the platform. And the way I ge generally recommend you do it is that you just Google Facebook Audience Insights, you click on the link, and then you go to Audience Insights. It's easier than trying, to, it is kind of tucked away in this platform, but I find it easier just to Google it and get there. So just Google Facebook Audience Insights, go to Audience Insights, and if you have a business manager account with an ad account created, you will then see this. And what this allows you to do is put in any interest criteria. and see what the audience demographics are in the United States or any local uh, area that you want of that group. So let me, so if the interest is too remote, it can sometimes, um, cause, so let me try New York, see if that's a bigger. So now we see this is the, the demographics of people with interest in off-off-Broadway in the state of New York rather than in the whole United States. You can see, for instance, that all of Facebook is 55% women. Uh, interest in off-off-Broadway slightly trends higher among women. Uh, but you can also see that the age category, so the gray is all of Facebook, and that is essentially a proxy for all of the internet. The blue is people with this interest criteria. You can see that the um, interest in off-off Broadway is really among women age 35 to 44, uh, and then men over men and women over 45. So it's interesting. You know, there's not really a young audience for off-off Broadway, and so if you're a theater company, knowing this uh, could be very very helpful. And um, you know, we. Um, we strongly recommend you guys use this tool to help discover a little bit more about who your ideal target audience would be. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, we have a question in the chat uh, from Elaine Rinaldi. She says, Orchestra of Miami's Facebook account is linked to her personal page. Should a separate account be created in the business Facebook.com? So the answer is yes, but not quite in the way I think you're thinking about it. Every one of you, whether you're active on Facebook or not, has to have a Facebook personal page in order to be able to have a Facebook business page. And so if you then wanna also create a business account so you can run ads, that's a third thing you add. So it's not an either or, it's a both end. So you're gonna, you have to have a personal account, you have to have a business page, and then you have to create a business manager account. And then you attach your business page, and you assign yourself as an administrator. It's very confusing. And Facebook has a ton of tutorials walking you through. All you have to do is Google, how do I set up a business manager account? And they will walk you through in great detail how to do that. I think we only have time for two more questions. Are there any more questions? Zuri? So I was wondering if there's any advice you may have for um, a lot of us maybe doing our own ads. So captions and the way we describe um, the ads before they actually, well, usually after they see the video or see the photo, is there advice for how we should really capture the audience based on our caption or description of either a product or a webinar? So we do a lot of webinars and in-person events and yeah. we've done that. So what's like a good way to really capture an audience through our descriptions or captions? That's a perfect segue to what I wanted to end with. So let me hold off on answering that and take one more question and then I'll answer your questions, Zuri. Okay. Any other questions? By the way, Linda, it's nice to see you. I'm a board member of uh, CARTA and it's great to see you. Do you have a question? Anything I can help with? You too, Dan. No, this was very helpful. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm in a new department now, so I'm kind of starting off and I work with a lot of people who do uh, social media and our outreach. So this is just a very good um, intro for me. So thank you. It, it, it's funny. At 11, I have a meeting with your dean, uh, uh, Dean Schreiner. So I look forward to that. 
I'm sorry, Actually, we had a Dan, question. There's one yeah. more question in chat and then we'll go to your, um, to your final comments. Um, Elaine wanted to know, when you're creating an ad, should you create the audience based on each program or continue to use the lookalike? Yes, uh, both end. So um, a lookalike audience is who is my existing set of followers? And, and then to create a lookalike is to create a, um, a, an audience of people who are similar to that audience or friends of friends is another way to think about it. Um, and that's an incredibly effective form of advertising. It is reliant on you having an email list of your customers and your supporters. So you need that, you upload that into Facebook and then you create a lookalike. The, for those of you who wanna do that, um, and this will be in the notes that we send you, but I'm not gonna go over it, is you need to first create a customer file, custom audience. And then once you've created that customer file, custom audience, you then create a lookalike audience based off of it. It's a little technical, but you can Google that and there are tutorials on how to do that. And then you should also consider for each program targeting your ideal target audience for that program. And if your programs vary, those audiences will look very different. So that's kind of the answer to your question. Um, I, Andrea asked, what's the difference between social media marketing versus social media management? And can someone handle both for a company? Social media management is organic. Usually it's community management. It's responding to reviews and, and to engagement. Uh, it's doing organic posts. It's important that you manage your social media, you attend to it, you talk to people organically through it. Social media marketing is advertising, it's lead generation. And I have, I'm shocked by how many community managers don't know advertising. It's actually shocking to me because I don't know how you can be a 21st century community manager on social media and not know how to advertise on the platform. Frankly, if I had $1 to spend uh, on one or the other, I would definitely be doing lead generation rather than community management. I don't believe it's an either or though. I think in order to be a 21st century arts organization, you have to do both. No one ever said it was gonna be easy, guys. Um, let me uh, share my screen just to wrap up with um, what I think could be very helpful in thinking about like how the heck do I, excuse me, um, you know, do I uh, run an ad effectively? Um, and wh what that is, is called the BizHack lead building system. It's a very, I think, simple way uh, so you'll get all these. Um, we went through most all of this verbally, so don't worry, you're, you're gonna get it. Um, all right, here we are. Almost there. <laughs> you're gonna get all this, don't worry. Um, all right, so over seven years working with businesses and nonprofits, we found that there's a very simple way to think about any digital campaign that you do. The foundation the pillars and the steps. And so we call it a, a, the lead building because it's a building. The foundation is your business story. It's your nonprofit's purpose. It's your why. Why are you doing the work you're doing? Why is it important that people uh, are engaged with dance or theater or the arts? And why are you personally motivated as the executive director or the founder or the marketer? Why are you personally motivated to put that out in the world? That why that story is the foundation of all of your marketing and communications. And frankly, it's the foundation of your sales, your donor relations, your development. Um, it's really the foundation of your business. So without a solid foundation, your marketing and advertising will not work. You need to be very clear on why you do what you do and articulate that uh, ideally with a story. Next, when you're running a campaign, there are six things that you need to consider. And just like a building, if any of these pillars are weak, the entire structure will crumble. So you need to have a clear objective, right? Are you trying to get people to watch a video, which is an awareness, or are you trying to get them to buy a seat at a, a concert, which is a conversion? So you have to have a clear objective. Or are you trying to get them to give you their email, which is lead gen? Next is you have to have a very specific target audience. So a lookalike is a target audience. Um, you know, people who like Off Off Broadway is a target audience. And people who like this program or that program um, are a target audience. So every program that you do will have a different target audience. It's work to identify that target audience. And one program might have multiple different audiences that like it. So for instance, someone who's 
transgender friendly may not be a veteran, but both of them will meet at a uh, cabaret show. So they're both audiences, but they don't overlap. So you have one ad that targets transgender and focuses on the transgender friendly aspects of the uh, show and another ad that talks about um, to veterans and focuses more on the beautiful ladies taking their clothes off, right? So it's the same show, two different audiences, two different ads. Next is the irresistible offer. And this is where we're getting to your question uh, about like, how do you actually uh, do this? Um, and so with the irresistible offer, you really want to make sure, Zuri, that you're asking them to do something compelling. We often talk about the free irresistible offer. So a free irresistible offer could be, you know, buy one, get one free. Or, um, you know, if you, uh, you know, sign up for this, you'll get access to this other thing. You know, a free irresistible offer is a great way to sell to a stranger. Then there's the foot in the door offer, which is that initial offer that gets them to open their pocketbooks and pay. And then there's the upsell offer. Okay, they've purchased a ticket once, how do you get them to go and become a sustaining uh, donor or a subscriber? So the, you have an offer strategy and you make sure that these are very compelling and irresistible. Because remember, you're selling to strangers here. You, know, it's, you, you need to be very compelling. Then you have to have a video, a thumb stopping video. They call it thumb stopping because as you're scrolling, you want them to stop on your video. So the first two seconds of your video are critical. You want a compelling message that puts this all into a bow. And then finally, a specific call to action. That call to action is what gets them to go from looking at your ad to actually making a purchase. And then finally, in our paid programs, we walk people through a nine-step process for how to implement that. That's what like Michelle has done with us. We offer a scholarship for that paid program uh, for nonprofits. Um, it's a partial scholarship. We're very proud uh, to support nonprofits. We gave out more than $100,000 in scholarships last year, uh, and we uh, love having nonprofits in our program. And the last thing I just wanted to say is um, we're right now going through a terrible crisis. It's been more than a year. We all understand the danger to our organizations and even to our lives, but in this crisis is also opportunity. And so what I invite you to do is grasp the opportunity. Thank you so much for today and for your time and attention. Dan, thank you so much. Um, now you guys see why we are so thrilled to have Dan Gretsch as part of our Miami Arts Marketing Project group. He's been with us for several years and he always is a session leader and helps so much in creating content in our programs. Um, we gave Dan a half day seminar to do in one hour. So I know we went quickly through a lot of material. Um, I hope everybody got a lot out of this. Um, we want to end with a group shot that we can use on our social media. So if everybody can turn on their video and um, freshen up your look, um, Carmen is gonna take a screenshot and um, we'll send it to all of you also so that you can help us promote. So um, we- All will... right, at a count of three, I'm gonna go ahead and take the screenshot. So be ready. Get your smiles on. Ready? One, two, three. Got it. And let's do a one thumbs up one. All right, one second. Let me save this. Okay, ready? So we're going to do one with a thumbs up. Everybody with your thumbs up and smiling. Ready? One, two, three. Got it. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, watch your e inbox. We are going to send Dan's um, presentation. We're going to send a survey and we're going to send a resource list to you. And we'll also include information on upcoming MAMP programs. Um, thanks again, Dan. This was really um, a lot of help. Absolutely. And uh, I put a link to the scholarship application. If in the follow-up, uh, in addition to the PDF, which I'm going to be sending you, if you wanted to put the scholarship link as well. And uh, I'll also be following up individually with you guys in case you want to, there's anything more that I can do to help. I'm here to help. Uh, I love working with nonprofits. My wife runs a nonprofit. Uh, I'm here as a resource for you. Uh, I work with Philanthropy Miami, the Give Miami Day, and the Miami Foundation, and obviously MAMP. And so I'm here to help. And thank you. Thank you for your time.
We really we'll appreciate include, you, Dan. We'll include we appreciate that you. link. We'll include that link in the resources. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye, everybody. Great talking to you.